In this session 31 of a 36 session corporate finance class, I'd like to talk about growth, a central input into valuation. I'd like to talk about different approaches to estimating growth, but hone in on estimating growth based on fundamentals, how much a company reinvests and how well it reinvests. In the last session, we talked about the first two inputs into valuation. We talked about getting the cash flows and the discount rates. And in this session, I want to talk about the next input. And this is the input that most people have trouble with, which is estimating future growth. In the larger picture, here's where we are. We set the building blocks for valuation in the first session. We talked about cash flows and the discount rates in the last one. We're going to build on growth on this one. So let's think about estimating growth for a company. Let's start with the two most common ways in which people estimate growth. The first, of course, is to look at the past. I call it historical growth, and that's a logical place to start. What kind of growth has this company had over the last three years, the last five years, the last 10 years? That sounds like a fact, right? You say that, that shouldn't be different across different people, but you'd be surprised at how different these numbers can be if you're looking at different time periods. In fact, your starting point and ending point matter. How you compute the growth rate, using arithmetic averages or a compounded average. It could also vary depending on which measure of earnings you use to compute your growth rate. The growth rate in EBITDA, the growth rate in EBIT, the growth rate in net income, and the growth rate in earnings per share can all be very different numbers. What I'm trying to argue for here is while people talk about the historical growth rate as if it's a fact, it is an estimate like everything else, and it's not a very good one. And here's what I mean about it not being a very good one. There are studies that have actually looked at how good a predictor past growth is of future earnings growth, and the answer is it's not that good, especially if you look at long time periods. Put differently, if you tell me how quickly your company grew over the last five years, I'm not sure it tells me very much about what the growth rate will be over the next five years. The other factor to keep in mind when you look at historical growth is especially if you have a small company that's been growing, past growth can be very misleading. Because even if the company still remains a good company, growth rates are going to start to scale down as the company gets bigger. So look at historical growth, but don't assume that future growth is always going to follow that pattern. Here's the other way in which you can estimate growth. You can outsource it. You can ask somebody else what the growth rate is going to be. Usually that somebody else will be somebody you think is more knowledgeable about the company than you are. For instance, many people who value companies in the US use analyst estimates of growth to project out future earnings. Those analyst estimates of growth have two problems. One is they're often in earnings per share. And if you're valuing a company based on operating income, that earnings per share growth might not be that useful. The second is analyst estimates of growth as estimates for future growth are not that good. In fact, they're very good at projecting maybe next quarter's earnings, but if you're looking at a five-year growth rate, an analyst estimate of growth is not that good. You're saying, what about managers of the company? They know a lot more about the company than I do. They should have better estimates of growth. I wish. It's true managers of a company know more about the company than you do, but they have a fundamental problem. They're biased. It's very difficult for a manager to tell you, I'm a bad manager. I'm going to ruin this company. So as a general rule, both historical growth and outside estimates are not great ways of thinking about growth, which leaves you in a quandary because you're saying, what do I use instead? Here's the point I'm trying to make. Growth in a company has to be earned. It can't be endowed. You and I don't have the power to go around giving companies high growth just because we feel like it. For a company to have high growth, it's got to pull off a fairly tough trick. First, it's got to reinvest a big chunk of its earnings back in the business. So how much do you reinvest is the first question I need the answer to. The second question I'm going to ask you is how well do you reinvest? So let's assume you're looking at an equity valuation. How much you reinvest, I'm going to measure by looking at your retention ratio, the percentage of the net income that you don't pay out as dividends. How well you reinvest, I'm going to measure with a return on equity. So if you have a retention ratio of 80% and a return on equity of 30%, 80% of 30% is 24%, that becomes a growth in net income. If you're looking at operating income, the definitions of reinvestment and quality of returns become slightly different. You measure how much you reinvest with a reinvestment rate. You're saying, what's that? It's your net capex and change in working capital, that direct measure of reinvestment as a percentage of your after-tax operating income. And how well you reinvest, you capture with a return on invested capital, a number we've used already to compute the quality of the existing investment of the company. It's the after-tax operating income divided by the invested capital. Reinvestment rate times return on capital is the expected growth in operating income. So here again, making the choice as to whether you're valuing equity or valuing the business is critical. You want to try this out? Let's start with Deutsche in 2008. 
In 2008, I computed the retention ratio for Deutsche Bank and the return in equity for Deutsche Bank. The retention ratio I came up with for Deutsche Bank was about 67%, and the return in equity they had was 19.45%. That's a remarkably high return in equity for large bank, right? And that's what worried me. 2007 was a very good year for banks, and I was concerned that if I took those 2007 numbers and used them as my base case numbers in my valuation, that I'd probably overestimate the growth rate at 13.04%, which is the product of those two numbers. So you're saying, what choice do I have? The case of Deutsche, I looked at a five-year average, and the five-year average retention ratio gave me more reasonable numbers. I came up with a return in equity of 11.81%, much lower than the current return in equity, and a retention ratio of 45.72%. You take the product of those two numbers, you come up with an expected growth rate of 5.4%, which strikes me as a more reasonable forward-looking growth rate. What I'm trying to emphasize here is when you do valuation, there is no rule, no law that says you're stuck with last year's numbers. You have the freedom to roam, to look across time, to look at averages, and use those average numbers if you feel they give you better estimates. So that's how I'm going to get the expected growth rate in Deutsche Bank in 2008. Now let me take Tata Motors. In the last session, we looked at the free cash flow equity for Tata Motors, and I estimated a re, a, a, an equity reinvestment rate. What's different between an equity reinvestment rate and a retention ratio? Rather than just take the portion of the net income that doesn't get paid out in dividends, I actually explicitly estimate how much the company is reinvesting back into the business by taking net capex and change in working capital and the change in debt. And at least over the five-year period that I looked at Tata Motors, in spite of the fact that the numbers moved around, the average equity reinvestment rate was 87.7%. Then I looked at the return on equity. The return equity, again, has been volatile over time, but the average return equity over the five years was 43.34%. So here again, I was faced with a choice. In valuing Tata Motors going forward, I could take the 2013 numbers, which gave me a growth rate of 24.13%, because both the return and equity and retention ratio were lower, or I could use the average numbers from 2008 through 2013, and the expected growth rate I would get because the retention ratio and the, and the return on equity was so high, would be 38%. That's a judgment we have to come back and make. But as you can see, it's a judgment that you're entitled to make as somebody valuing a company. Finally, let's think about the return on equity. Clearly, a high return on equity is good, right? Because it pushes up your expected growth rate. So how does a company end up with a high return on equity? There are two ways it can, it can end up with a high return on equity. One is to take great projects. But that's so much work. Here's the other way you can end up with a high return equity. You can take average projects and use a lot of debt. You're saying, why would that help me? Let's take an example. Let's assume you're a company with a 15% return on capital. That's not bad, right? But let's say you can borrow money at 5% after taxes. And let's say you go out and borrow a dollar. When you borrow that dollar, you, in effect, have claimed the extra 10%, the difference between the return on capital and the after-tax cost of debt for your equity investors. Algebraically, you can actually write the return equity as the sum of two factors. One is the return on capital, that's a base number, plus a leverage effect, which I compute by taking your debt to equity ratio. And here I have to look at the actual amount invested in debt and equity in the investment and taking the difference between the return on capital and the after-tax cost of debt. Now you're saying, who cares? Let's take a very simple example. Let's assume you have a company which has a 15% return on capital, an after-tax cost of debt of 5%, and a book debt to equity ratio of 100%. So it's using a dollar of debt for every dollar of equity. What will the return on equity for this company be? Think about it. Your base number is 15%, right? But they're going to go out and borrow a dollar of debt for every dollar of equity, and every dollar of debt you take adds an extra 10%. And since you're borrowing a dollar of debt for a dollar of equity, your return on equity is going to be close to 25%, the 15%, plus the spread between the return on capital and the after-tax cost of debt. And he's saying, so what? It has a high return equity. Let's assume I gave you another company which uses no debt and actually has a return on capital of 25% and a return on equity of 25%. If they're both in the same business, they have the same business risk. As an investor, which one would you value more highly? It's the same return equity. They have the same growth in earnings, right? You're saying, so what's different about the companies? Remember that this is an equity valuation, so you need a cost of equity. That cost of equity is based on a beta, and that beta should be a levered beta, right? The second company that's all equity funded, that earned a 25% return on capital and return on equity, 
its cost of equity would be much lower than the first company, which effectively also means that even though the second company and the first company have the same return equity, the second company will have a higher equity value because it's all equity funded. What I'm trying to say is there are no, no, no free lunches in valuation. Companies that try to pump up their return equity by borrowing more money, you've got to penalize through their cost of equity. If you let them have the same cost of equity, of course they're gonna look like they're worth more, but they just look like they're worth more. They're not actually worth more. So when you think about decomposing return equity, that's why we decompose return equity. We want to see how much comes from quality project picking and how much comes from leverage because the latter has to be built into your beta and your cost of equity. Now let's talk about estimating growth in operating income for Disney. In the last session, we talked about the reinvestment rate that Disney had in the most recent year. We took net capex and change in working capital. We div divided by the after-tax operating income, and we came up with a reinvestment rate of 53.93%. You might not remember this, but we also computed a return on invested capital for Disney, looking back over time, of 12.61%. Now let's assume that Disney can maintain both these numbers, and it's an assumption. If it can maintain that return on capital, 12.61%, and continue to reinvest the way it did in 2013, its expected growth in earnings going forward will be 6.8%. That's a 12.61% times the 53.93%. The advantage of linking your growth rate to how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest, it shifts the onus back to the company. Every company wants to grow faster, right? If a company comes back to you and says, look, I don't like your growth rate, it's too low, your response should be, tell me what's going to change. Are you going to reinvest more? Are you going to reinvest better? I can't give you a 10% growth rate just because I feel like it. So tie your growth rate to how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest. Now, the approaches that I've just described, where you tie growth to reinvestment rate times return on capital or retention ratio times return equity, work only if you have stable return on equity and return on capital. If you have a company where the margins and the, and the accounting returns are changing, don't use these approaches. In fact, in general, if you have a shifting company, a shifting company where you have revenue growth changing, your margins are changing, your returns on capital are changing, my suggestion to you is approach evaluation in three steps. Start off first by projecting the top line, which is revenues, estimating revenue growth. Second, estimate your margins over time, and they can change over time. They can either go up or down. Third step, estimate what you will reinvest. And I'll, I use a ratio called the sales to invested capital ratio. And the way to think about this is I'm estimating how much you will need to reinvest for every additional dollar of revenue that you have as a company. The first step will give you the revenues. The second step will give you the operating income. The third step will give you the free cash flow to the firm. Let me try this for Baidu because it is a young growth company. And with Baidu, I allowed for a high revenue growth because it's in a growth market, 25% for the next five years. And then I started to scale the growth down because the company's getting pretty big. For the margin, initially I assumed that they would be able to maintain the astronomically high margins they have as a company, almost 49%. But over time, I assumed that there would be pressure on those margins. There'd be competition pushing the margins down. That in turn has an effect on my future operating income. To estimate my reinvestment each year, I use that sales to capital ratio, which for Baidu, I assumed would be equal to the industry average of 2.64. What that effectively allows me to do is assume that for every $2.64 in additional revenue, I have to invest a dollar in capital. So the way I estimate my reinvestment each year is I take the change in revenues over the previous year and divide by 2.64. Very simplistic, but it allows me, in a sense, to get what my reinvestment should be each year. I subtract that reinvestment out from my after-tax operating income, I get a free cash flow to the firm. This is the way I approach valuing young growth companies. Start with revenue growth, project out margins, estimate reinvestment, get a free cash flow to the firm. That free cash flow to the firm could very well be negative early on. And if it's negative early on, read it for what it's telling you. It's telling you that this company will need to raise fresh capital in the near future. And if it's a young growth company, that makes complete sense. So if you think about getting future growth, don't get stuck in equations or fixed formula. Be flexible, be creative, and be realistic. Thank you very much for listening.